Hi, everybody. So we'll start the, the uh, webinar now. So thank you for joining our panel today about fine arts schools in the UK and the USA. My name is Abby, and I'm really, really excited to be moderating the panel today. So for those of you who are tuning into Millie for the first time, uh, we're a company that's dedicated to building a global community for international students. So that's why we host these panels and, and webinars every single weekend. Um, so if you're interested in any future events we'll be hosting, please feel free to follow us on Instagram at Millie underscore group. And you'll have all sorts of updates on there of, of any future events that might be interesting for you. So for today's panel, uh, we have some questions that we've already prepared, but we really do encourage you to submit any questions you might have in the chat bar in the, in the Zoom call, and we will go through them towards the end, um, integrate your questions into the panel. So for the first 35, 40 minutes, um, we'll go through the pre-prepared questions, and then after that, we will hopefully go on to yours. Um, so I encourage you to ask any questions you might be interested in. They could be general questions for everyone, or if you had a question for a specific panelist, please feel free to do that. Um, so we have three really cool panelists today and we're really excited to hear about all of their experiences. So we will get started and we'll start with a bit of an introduction. We want to get to know our panelists a bit better. So I'll ask panelists, could you please tell us your name, the city you're from and where you live now? Where did you attend university, what you studied and a fun fact about yourself? And we will start with Matthew. Sure thing. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Millie, for having me alongside these other wonderful panelists. Um, my name is Matthew, and I was born in New York, raised in New York, and actually went to school in New York. Uh, I studied piano performance uh, at the Juilliard School in New York City, and I studied there for 12 years because I started when I was 10 years old. So it was a bit of a wild ride, which I can happily tell you more about. Um, and one fun fact about myself is that even though I'm a pianist, I love playing basketball and I play at the YMCA like four times a week. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining and thank you many for having me. Uh, so I'm uh, Abdul Khal Khirmour or Abed, uh, that's the short version. I was born and raised in Amman, Jordan. Uh, where I lived for 18 years of my life. Uh, and then I went uh, to the University of Bath to study architecture, uh, where I studied that for four years. And I'm currently living uh, in London, where I kind of started my first job. Uh, and the fun fact about me is I kind of like to do all sorts of different sports, like to go and try different stuff, like paddle tennis, football, uh, shooting, racing, skydiving, and so on. Hello everyone, I'm so happy that I'm here today and uh, to have a chat with all of you. Uh, my name is Dalia Mohad. I originally am from Sudan, Khartoum. Um, I grew up there up until I was like 10. And then I moved to the Gulf in Bahrain um, where I spent the next 10 years of my life. Um, at 17, I moved to the UK and I studied architecture. Um, I just graduated in July and now I'm back home. Um, and yeah, one fun fact about me is I also like to play basketball, um, but I love digital art. Um, so whenever I have like free time, I usually sketch on my iPad and create some nice designs. Thank you. You guys have some really interesting hobbies. I love to hear that. Um, so starting with our kind of pre-university time, I'd love to hear about how you get into university and what the process was like. Um, so in terms of your the course you chose to study, did you always want to study kind of fine art or the courses that you, you chose? And why was that or why not? How did you end up deciding that that was the course for you? So that's a great question. It's different for every person, but for me, I knew at a pretty young age um, because when I started giving recitals just, you know, as a kid, five, six, seven, I ended up improving pretty quickly and it just felt really natural to me to play the piano. And Juilliard has a pre-college division, um, which is kind of unique. It's conservatory, so they do music classes on the weekends for students who are in high school and middle school. And so I did that. And when you do a course like that, it kind of prepares you for potentially going to the conservatory or the college at Juilliard. So 
I actually knew from a pretty young age that I was going to do piano long term, which is pretty unique, actually. For me, uh, it's kind of like I was always interested in design oriented fields when I was in school. Uh, I didn't start thinking about like exactly what I want to do until I was uh, started. I started applying, but I was always kind of enrolling in uh, design and creative oriented fields. I would always go into like courses such as like uh, calligraphy, photography, painting, uh, sketching and so on. Uh, but then with kind of more research and knowledge about architecture, I kind of realized that it incorporates that kind of um, humanistic, cultural, societal uh, values and factors into kind of design as well, and something which is also physical, so it means that kind of technical knowledge. Uh, so that kind of fascinated me, and that's that kind of was the main reason to apply to architecture and study it. Um, I feel like for me, I kind of knew since I was like, 11 or 12, I knew I was intrigued by the idea of fine art and the creative uh, part of myself. Um, growing up, I went to, I, we used to travel a lot as a family. And so um, we used to go to different countries, like we saw the pyramids of Egypt and like um, so many other architectural structures. And I was always fascinated by them. Um, and so I kind of realized I had that passion at a young age. Um, however, I was more into the arts in general. So I would watch things like Art Attack on the, like the TV and um, follow along with them and learn from them. And um, I was very in tune with that part of myself. Um, however, as I grew up, um, I was kind of hesitant between two different majors, like very completely different majors, just like medicine and architecture. Um, so I had a bit of a dilemma, but I knew for a fact I was more in tune with my artistic self and I wanted to improve that dexterity and um, that was kind of one of the main reasons why it, I got pushed into architecture and um, exploring all of that um, but because I was hesitant I had to basically speak to like professors and like people that I know who are in the architecture field um, and once I spoke to them I realized you know what this could possibly be for me you know um, because I was very creative and I wanted to kind of implement that into something bigger. Yeah. Thank you. So you all mentioned that you kind of did courses or classes outside of school that really helped to enrich kind of your decision and your experience. I'm interested to know kind of those, those things that you did outside of school, how did you bring them into your studies? You know, in, what, in which ways did they help you? Well, since I knew that I was headed to becoming a pianist full time, what was really helpful for me was doing recitals and competitions from a young age. So I think that, you know, if you can find kind of tasks or, you know, classes or things like that in your field you're interested in outside of school, it's great because my school wasn't, you know, helping me do competitions. I'd have to find them, sign up, sometimes travel and do them. But they taught me a lot about the potential career and then gave me a really valuable experience, especially with being nervous in big performances. And um, so competitions and recitals were definitely kind of go-to experiences for me. Uh, for me, like all the courses I did weren't exactly architecture related. It was more uh, design oriented, as I said, but I think they all kind of fed uh, back into architecture and my architectural education uh, because it kind of like as a young, from a young age, like going into these uh, courses, I started thinking like a designer. I started thinking more creatively and I started to question things because in architecture, you always need to constantly question what's right, what's wrong. Uh, why are you doing the stuff you do for certain reasons? And I kind of got that uh, from an early age, uh, just doing uh, these courses, but also other stuff such as kind of starting to learn about design values, uh, starting to understand kind of composition. And for, for example, like in photography, composition, composition is like really important, but also in architecture, when you're kind of presenting everything, you need to kind of understand composition and so on. So kind of all these design uh, skills, if you will, I started kind of uh, getting them from an early age uh, while I was in school. 
and definitely helped me out when I uh, went into architecture. Um, yeah, honestly, for me, school had uh, it played a very important role into um, shaping that part of myself. Um, I feel like the design class um, that we had to visual arts, um, we had it ever since we were very little. And so every year we would kind of develop even more in our skills and, um, uh, you know, experiment with different styles and mediums. Um, and I feel like that taught me a lot. And even just like seeing my peers and like how they design things, I learned from them and I wanted to implement it in different other ways. Um, but I feel like the more I grew up as well, um, I started like volunteering into things that are design related. So for example, we would uh, paint murals in kindergartens or uh, we would basically be the design team of the carnival at our school. Um, so there's always like events, you know, like Halloween events or family day events. And they would always like require somebody who's creative and they require like a group of people who are gonna design something to depict and like illustrate the whole idea of the carnival. And I basically took it upon myself to join that and, um, you know, be a part of the design team. Cause at the end of the day, um, showing that and sharing that passion with others like brings so much joy to me. And I think that's why I really um, developed in my architecture and my designing skills in general and the architecture ones. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I think one really useful part of today's panel is the fact that we have kind of different experiences. So university in the US, the US and in the UK. Um, so in terms of the application process, I'd love to hear kind of the differences. So what was the application process like in, in the country that you applied for? And did you need to have something like a portfolio or was there any kind of were there any useful resources that helped you to prepare any steps that you made to make that process any smoother? Well, I can't speak much for uh, applications in the UK, obviously, but I'll tell you a little bit about what happened in the US. Um, yes, I kind of did need a portfolio. Essentially, it was just your, you know, your resume and your um, kind of performing um, biography, essentially. And then for artists like musicians that were my classmates, we had to give, and this is pretty unique, like three videos of our pieces being played in a either a live you know concert hall or in a studio so that was kind of our uh, portfolio and um, any useful resources to help me prepare honestly it was showing these videos um, or even playing for people to get their feedback and as many feedback options as possible because when you're younger you you can be a specialist but it is really helpful getting feedback from people you trust before you release the final product for applications. I guess same goes for essays, but that was my biggest uh, piece of advice. Show it to people. I mean, I, I kind of, when I was applying, I applied all over the place. I applied to the UK, to the US and so on. So I kind of know a bit about the US, but uh, in terms of the UK, it's uh, probably an easier kind of application process uh, in comparison, because it's like you apply through the UCAS, which is the website uh, we use to kind of apply to universities for bachelors. You find most of the you know, UK universities on that. Uh, you kind of send it out to five uh, to five universities of your choice, and uh, you kind of submit information about yourself and so on, you know, what you've done in school and uh, so on. Uh, but the most part of that application process is the personal statement. Uh, my advice would be to kind of focus on that personal statement because it is your chance to kind of stand out from other people. It's your chance to sell yourself, to kind of be yourself, and uh, hopefully un universities would, would like it. So definitely invest time in the personal statement to kind of draft that, but also uh, kind of show it to other people to review it and give you feedback about it. Uh, and uh, in terms of like help, uh, I had uh, an amazing department, university counseling department at school. 
and I kind of utilize that. So if you kind of have that in your school, I would definitely advise you to go after them and make them help you. Uh, and if you don't, then definitely seek out like external people. I think Mili do provide some tutoring sessions. And uh, so definitely you need, like go out, seek for help and uh, talk to people who are, have been through that process. Yeah, honestly, I agree very much with Abdi. We had similar experiences. Um, let me start off with the portfolio. Honestly, um, the portfolio, it was kind of um, a last minute thing that I realized we had to do in a way. Um, but I was very much prepared for it because um, growing up, I always um, invested my time into um, basically undertaking like some art like creating some artworks um and expanding the portfolios experimenting with different mediums um and so i had uh, a variety of things that i could add to my portfolio which i eventually did and um i went to my visual arts teacher i asked him about it um i showed him the portfolio itself um he kind of like went okay this is good um you can proceed with the applications um i used the same uh website as uh, abdu which is ucas um but at the same time we had our school provided us with um this kind of like talk and where this agency came and they told us we can help you out with the university applications and whatnot and um it was honestly like i feel like one of the best decisions um that i made was to like go to the agency and seek for help because i feel like um during school you don't really know what you're kind of um gonna do in the future let's say when it comes to applications and so you'd need somebody to look up to somebody you can ask for help um just any kind of assistance. Um, I feel like that agency, which is called Education Zone here in Bahrain, um, it helped a lot. They made the application 10, 10 times like faster and easier. Um, we had to also have like a visa. Um, so we had to apply for that. And in order to ensure it doesn't get declined, um, you had to go through a specific process and you have to have the right resources um, and the right forms to fill out. And I feel like they, completely you know helped with that um the personal statement i feel like was kind of my favorite part in a way alongside the portfolio um because it was an interesting experience everybody had like something different to say and everyone had like a different approach that you could follow um but at the end of the day i realized it's something that i'm going to write about myself and about the career that i would like to you know envision in the future and the you know, things like that. So I basically wrote it from my heart and I um, went over it a couple of times. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you shouldn't overthink it too much and you should just write it and then go over it, change a few things here and there. Um, but as long as you're being yourself, that's really, truly what matters. It's interesting that a couple of you have brought up the personal statement because I remember when I was applying through UCAS to university, it was the first time I'd ever had to write something about myself so kind of formally and I'd actually quite like to, before we move on to kind of the academic side when you got to university, I'd like to just think about kind of what, what do you think are the important things to include on that personal statement because sometimes you start with a blank page and you don't know where to begin. What do you think is important to include and how did you make yours stand out? Because that was what I found quite tricky to do myself. It's very tricky. I'm applying now to business school actually so I am writing again six or seven personal statements so I'm actually like right in the in the thick of it. Um, so for me, it was just being truthful and confident and, but not, you know, prideful or cocky or anything like that. And just finding the balance because people do want to know the awesome things that you've done. Um, and uh, they actually want to be impressed in a, and, and support you. So you can really tell them honestly, the things that you've done and the things that you're passionate about and you know, obviously don't, don't lie at all because you can really smell that, you know, a mile away. Uh, and essentially like you are enough without having to kind of gild everything or make it, um, seem more than it is. So I'd say just be truthful and, um, go with what you're most passionate about. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with Matthew. Like everything you've said, uh, definitely just be truthful, uh, show your passion. Uh, yeah, just be yourself. I think in the one, like the person statement in the UK is quite different to the US. The US, you can, like some universities, you can write about whatever you want, which is uh, probably a bit more like overwhelming because uh, uh, there's so much you can write about. But uh, I, I remember when I was applying to the US, some of them I, I was like writing about failure and kind of how failure helps me, like how I look at failure as a positive thing. I think that kind of pushes me and drives me to kind of succeed in the future, which, uh, which was definitely, which, yeah, which was definitely like really enjoyable to write because uh, it's different. Uh, you can be creative with it. While the one in the UK is a bit more kind of structured, you have to talk about like what you've done, what you want to do in the future and your passion. But uh, I think both are like great opportunities to kind of just, uh, yeah, uh, convince like universities about you and uh, yeah, sell your sentence, stand out from the crowd. Yeah, I honestly agree with everything that they said. Um, I feel like um, it's a bit nerve wracking to begin with. Um, just especially that first line um, that you have to write, you're always like, I really don't know what I'm going to say or where this is going to go. Because you don't have like a, a structure that you have to stick to. It's literally something that you have to kind of experiment and write. And then you have to see, okay, is this good? Is this not good? Um, so I feel like the one thing you should do is probably like maybe write the first draft as take it literally as a draft you know um don't think oh this is going to be the one i'm going to use to apply for unis um i think just write it and f see like where you're going with it um put your ideas like together um you have to kind of as M matthew said you don't be cocky about it but you do have to um write some of your achievements um the people you look up to for example so i remember um we were somebody like gave me the advice of adding the one person I look up to, let's say when it comes to architecture. Um, and so I had like a couple of people that I admired their work, um, but eventually I had to like choose one and like, for example, link it to um, why I made that decision to go down this route, let's say, um, and things like such, or for example, the activities that you'd like, um, to do in the future in relation to the course. Um, and just talk about yourself in a way, like how, where that passion derived from um, and how you got to where you are at the time, you know? Um, but yeah, I think just be yourself and um, hope for the best. Thank you. So moving on to almost kind of more once you got to uni or just before, um, what drove your decision to study where you studied? So was it a particular reason you wanted to study in the US or the UK? Um, was there a particular location within that country that you wanted to study? What kind of drove your decision to pick your particular university? It's different for everyone, but for me, there were a few factors. One, my family was in New York and so was my school, Juilliard. So I got into um, a few schools and some were further away and um, family was a factor for me. If I could stay near to them and also get a great education, that was a big plus. Um, and then I'm not sure if it's this way in architecture, maybe you guys could tell me more, but in the arts, like the you know performing arts, we really tend to seek out a teacher, like a one teacher typically that we really want to learn from. Um, it's that way with like violin, cello, piano, and opera. And so there was a teacher that I, A, really connected well with, and B, that I had known prior to my time at uni. So I was excited to study with him, and he accepted me into his studio of students. So it's like, you know, family plus a mentor that I really appreciated and was excited to learn from. So for that, it was kind of a a no-brainer once those both kind of came together. I mean, for me, uh, as I said, kind of I applied all over the place, the US, uh, the UK, Canada, UAE, and so on. But uh, I kind of in the end took the decision to go to the UK for several, fa several factors as well. 
uh, one of which was actually the University of Bath. I researched more about it and talked to people who went to the University of Bath and uh, it proved to be a very rigorous course providing students with uh, like really good knowledge to actually go into the profession as opposed to other universities. Some other universities are maybe more like, um, I guess, artistic in a way, uh, but uh, the kind of, I think in, in Bath, they provide a good balance between kind of uh, the artistic side of architecture, but also the technical side of architecture, providing us with like enough knowledge to, to actually go into the profession and uh, start designing buildings which are actually going to be built. Uh, another part of the course in, at Bath was uh, the fact that I go, like we go on placements. So in my second and third year, I took two semesters uh, to actually go into practice into different companies and work with people in the profession. So I wanted to kind of get that experience very early on because I kind of uh, really um, admired that kind of duality between uh, uh, education and uh, profession. Uh, and I think they kind of feed off each other uh, and it kind of really enriches me as a designer. Uh, other factors included kind of um, uh, the UK being closer to home and as opposed to the US, so it would be easier to kind of go back and forth in holidays and so on. Uh, and also the, the course uh, courses in the UK are generally shorter in terms of uh, time period for bachelors. So my course was four years in other universities, it's uh, perhaps like three years. Uh, but in the US and other kind of countries, it's like five, six years. So that was also a factor which uh, I considered when taking that decision. Um, yeah, I think when I was um, when I was growing up, ideally I wanted to study in the U.S., um, but I had kind of little to no knowledge on how that was going to work out. Um, but I feel like when I reached the age where I had to like kind of make this like big life decision, I wanted to kind of explore other options, and this is where the U.K. came in. Um, I feel like, in a way. It was like a huge shift between always, you know, envisioning to like study somewhere and then studying somewhere else. It's like a, um, a dilemma, as I said before. But um, I feel like it was it was like a good one um, because I wanted to explore. I've always visited the U.S. Like I used to go to the U.S. every single year. Um, and so I was like, you know what, I'm already familiar with that place um, in a sense. And I want to explore somewhere different and I want to kind of just aggrandize my knowledge on like other cultures and being open to like other opportunities, let's say. Um, and so I looked um, obviously into the universities there and um, the course. And as Abdi said, it was three years. I thankfully I managed to skip a foundation year because um, I had enough international baccalaureate points to uh, move on to first year. And so as soon as I received that opportunity, I figured there's no way I'm gonna let that go. Um, you can easily just, you know, finish your degree in three years, gain as much knowledge um, as possible from the university. Um, one of my friends, actually two of them, their sister, um, studied at the university that I went to, which is the University of Salford in Manchester. And um, she loved the place. She always praised it. Um, she said it was very diverse and um, we had like a solid uni campus um, and the university just kept growing um, every single year, honestly. Um, and it was very nice, you know, just looking at it and seeing where it came from and like um, the changes that it went through um, and how they were establishing the course. Um, and I felt like it was very creative, honestly, the shift between uh, school and uh, first year of uni was quite a nice experience um, because I felt like we established like the technical um, aspects of architecture, but at the same time, we were very um, in sync with the creative sides. Um, they didn't really limit us to a certain thing. We had like crazy ideas um, and they were very open to it, which I really admired. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a nice experience to go through, honestly. Thank you. So can we kind of touched upon your courses that are so different of, well, from the US and the UK, but I'd like to know what would a typical day to day life be like on your course and at university where you study? So what did the day look like? What did the week look like? How did you organize your time? You know, what were your lectures and seminars like? What would your typical day be at university? 
My typical day was definitely spent primarily practicing the piano. No joke, I, I would I would practice five to six hours a day, every day, just practicing either collaborative pieces like chamber music with you know a violinist and a cellist and a piano like a piano trio, or preparing for solo recitals. So that was kind of my study time essentially. Um, Juilliard offers um, some academic classes. Of course, you can take liberal arts, which I did as well. But interestingly, they do not offer science. They do not offer math. So it's highly artistic. Um, they do a reciprocity with Columbia University. So you can take classes at Columbia as well for academics. But um, yeah, I would definitely probably wake up do two hours of practice and then maybe I would do some ear training or music theory because those are some classes they also prepare you for and maybe a little bit of composition actually because some classes require that um, and then some more practicing and then we have once a week we would have a studio class which was one of my favorites where my teacher would have his entire studio of students and maybe four or five people play every week. And instead of just the teacher commenting, all of the fellow students comment and kind of have a dialogue. Um, so that was one of my favorite elements of my day, but yeah, definitely practice, practice, practice. Uh, for architecture, like in, in comparison to other uh, degrees at the university, I think we were the most to, uh, or the least that ha had lectures, because uh, architecture is the one. It's very subjective in a way. Uh, it's not about like uh, it's not about facts, the teaching facts. It's about kind of learning through doing. So it's kind of the same to Matthew, where you kind of learn through just practicing and doing it. So the course was primarily structured around the uh, design studio module. So it's kind of the main module. It has the most credits. And we would spend most of our time, like we, in the beginning of the semester, we would get a brief and uh, we'd spend the rest of the semester or the year just designing for that brief. And that was kind of our design studio module. So that typical day would be just going to studio and uh, just working on that, uh, on that project, which I have been assigned. Uh, and then weekly we have these tutorial sessions with uh, our tutors where we get feedback on our uh, on the work that we've done throughout the week and what we can kind of improve on the design and then in kind of the final year we they also integrate other uh, consultant tutorials so we start to get not just architectural but also structural environmental landscape and so on tutorials which was kind of very interesting to kind of work with different people from different pro professions because architecture is a very interdisciplinary or uh, the construction industry as a whole is a very interdisciplinary kind of uh, in the industry and the architecture kind of feeds into that uh, as well. Uh, but then we also have lectures for other modules, uh, which ranged from kind of practice management and law, detailed design, uh, history and theory, and those were kind of the more kind of rigid facts. And we had other submissions for these uh, different modules, but they, did, they didn't take as much time as kind of the main design studio module, which had most of the credits. So yeah, I typically would be just be like in studio working on these, uh, on the design studio. And then when I have the time, I'd kind of balance out the other modules and work on the submissions for those modules. And most of the stuff we did were marked based on submissions, so hand-ins and uh, not exams. I had, I think I had like two exams at first year and that was, that was it. Um, yeah, I think um, so many of my answers are going to be very much like Abdi's because we have, we went through the same exact experience, kind of. Um, even the modules that he was mentioning, I had the same exact modules. Um, the only difference is that uh, we had, so we had three modules every, every single semester, um, but they all had the same credits. Um, the design module, although it was the most prominent one and like the most um, important one, um, sometimes uh, other modules would kind of be integrated with that. So for example, we had um, this module about construction um, and it was basically related and linked to our design module um, where we would basically design um, 
in the main design module and then kind of do the technical stuff in the construction module. Um, but yeah, I think um, because we had like a variety of modules, um, we had like, let's say three lectures a week uh, on average. And then the rest of the week, we have the studio and the studio is basically our first home should I say, because we spent so much of our time there. Um, it's like you wake up, you go to your lecture and then you go to the studio. You basically go back home to sleep for like a few hours um, and then you come back to the studio again, you get your work done um, and then go to your next lecture. It was like a cycle basically. Um, and I'm saying it now and it sounds like it was very hectic, it was, but at the same time, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I feel like I had my friends around me. And um, obviously, this was before COVID and then ignore COVID and then after COVID. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of created like a nice environment where we can all work and learn from each other. Um, as Matthew said as well, we would always um, give each other feedback um, on the work. We would display our work, let's say, in um, partition walls. And um, it was very intriguing, you know, just seeing how everybody developed throughout the years as well. Um, and because we all kind of studied from home in the second year, going back to third year, it was very nice seeing how everybody kind of improved their artistic dexterities. Um, and I feel like that's the main, you know, goal from like, basically courses like such where fine arts is like embedded into um, the whole course in itself and the curriculum. Um, and so, yeah, that was basically the routine that we had. We obviously had the library, we would go there whenever we would have like a, an essay to write, let's say, so the history subject module. Um, and then in our final year, we had the dissertation, which was like this um, big essay. It was, um, they narrowed it down for us to 5,000 words, um, which honestly you can go above and beyond even more than 5,000 words because it kind of, um, you can choose a topic um, related to architecture, of course, and like a building, and you get to be creative with it. So the creativity was not only implemented in your designs, but it was also implemented in your writing. Um, and I really liked that. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. I'd love to hear how you all touched upon kind of collaborative learning, because at university you often pick a, a course for yourself, but you do have your course mates and there is often a kind of a fair amount of collaborative learning so it kind of in which ways were was the collaborative learning useful for you and how did you find was the best way to group study so a lot of people have seen Juilliard through the lens of movies or tv shows and it has a reputation for being very competitive um and people are cutthroat but I'll be honest that that didn't seem to be the case for me. Um, and I think a lot of my classmates would agree. People are competitive with themselves to become better, but not necessarily like you're trying to put other people down. And that was great because it allowed us to really help each other improve and grow. Practically, we would just play for each other all the time. Not necessarily just in those studio classes that I mentioned, but... Juilliard has a, a floor of just, I think it might be 150 practice rooms. It's like it's the fourth floor. Everyone knows where it is, what it is. And that's where you kind of, you know, knock on the door of your classmate and say, hey, do you, do you have five minutes? Can you hear this? Like, I'm, I want some feedback. And then maybe they'll play something for you. So that's kind of like the most basic way to collaborate. But I went a few steps further because I loved... Um, cross-disciplinary collaboration, which I feel like actually Juilliard doesn't do a great job facilitating. Maybe it's a little bit too difficult to coordinate, but I didn't care. I really wanted to work with dancers and singers and actors. So you know, I made friends with everyone and I would ask them if they needed help accompanying for their auditions, if they're singing something. And so I really sought out different chances to learn from others and just learn basically how to become more open. And that was probably the most valuable thing about collaboration and, you know, having other people's feedback kind of shape who you become 
later in life because we, we can't do it by ourselves as my as my fellow panelists know we need we need a team of people to support and um and we can also teach others too it's great i mean it's a really interesting question because uh, in architecture we kind of go like a lot of universities hand you like individual projects you work on these individual projects for like four or five years so on then you go into practice and you're working with like an insane amount of people and like insane amount of consultants that you're like way too overwhelmed uh because like you didn't expect it you're, you're like expecting to do design and so on which is what you're doing in like university but then you go and you're like okay uh there was like uh, the toilets on the cat plans and you're like this is just like a tiny element of what's happening but uh, i think in the university of bath like they they encourage collaboration a lot between different students and uh, just being in studio was honestly one of the best parts of of being in university because uh, yeah i'm just around these people who are in the kind of the same uh, the same position i am in and we're all working on like similar projects so uh, we all kind of understand each other's projects and we can, we're in that position to give each other feedback. And that also kind of prepares us for what's going to happen after, like when we go into like teams uh, and when we work in the profession, like it's, a, it's, a, it's very much based on different people's opinions and putting these different opinions and knowledges and experiences to come up with the most or the most suitable design. And Matthew mentioned interdisciplinary kind of collaboration, and uh, that also happened in the University of Bath, and they encouraged it. So we had uh, a lot of projects where we would work with civil engineers who are also studying in the university, and that kind of collaboration is uh, is, is is very important because when we go into practice, we're going to work, be working with civil engineers, and uh, if the civil engineer kind of disagrees to something. Uh, then we kind of need to change that design in a, in a certain way to adapt to the needs of the structure and so on. Uh, and that's what that's what happens in the profession, with, not just with civil engineers, but also with uh, many many consultant, consultants who work on the projects. And that's why in our final year projects, we had that kind of input from different consultants to, uh, to ma make our kind of projects more real and more buildable, because it really prepares you to kind of go into the practice. Yeah, I think um, honestly, collaboration is kind of one of the most important things and elements that you have to um, learn when it comes to architecture, because um, you end up working with so many other um, people when it comes to like the industry. Um, you'd be working, at, as Abdi said, with civil engineers, quantity surveyors, and um, many more people. Um, so I feel like when, it, when we were in uni in first year, we had uh, group projects that were very kind of small, but they did have, um, you know, like a stance when it comes to the modules that we were um, taking. Um, so we did kind of learn that aspect um, in a sense, because in a way the course does get a bit combat competitive. So I feel like from time to time when there is group work, um, it kind of showcases, um, you know, how people work in a setting like such. Um, because we're all creative majors, let's say, and you'd have sometimes like ideas clashing with each other, you know, but you have to learn um, to kind of bring those ideas to life um, as a team. Um, and then this helped a lot because in our final year, we had the multidisciplinary project uh, where we worked with construction project managers, quantity surveyors, building surveyors, um, interior architecture students. Um, and so it was kind of like an eye-opening experience because um, you learn to kind of do individual work throughout the whole three years. And then once you get, you know, this uh, module uh, where you kind of have to basically figure out everything, you know, in your own way and you learn from each other. I feel like that was a very great experience, honestly, although it was a bit tough at the start. Um, um, because of the like the different courses and how um, you know it was a new experience for everybody to say the least. Um, but some of the people, let's say, not in my group, uh, were actually working in the industry at the time, so they were doing part time um, studying, and I feel like that kind of helped because they showed us that, for example, our crazy ideas as architects, um, they kind of have to work in real life. Um, and they kind of show you the way 
to kind of do that. You learn from each other. Um, you learn about budgeting and all of these kinds of aspects that you honestly, as an architect, like as an architecture student, you don't really consider up until you get put in a position like that, where it's like, oh, your idea is crazy. We can't, we don't even have the cost to like, you know, establish it and um, undertake it in real life. Um, so yeah, collaboration was very, it was a very like nice aspect when it comes to um, this course. I'd love to hear about the positive experience of the collaboration and, and how helpful it's been. Because you're right, when you kind of go into life post university, it's all about collaboration when you get into the working world. So that's that's really interesting. Um, in terms of your actual specific course, I'd love to know what was your favorite aspect of it? What did you absolutely adore? And what was your least favorite kind of part of it? And how did you manage to get past that? It's always a tough question because some of the worst things about university in the moment you appreciate afterwards more, you know, but I think for me, looking back, the most enjoyable element was um, getting to meet these incredible artists that anywhere else, you know, you, you would never have a concentration of that many talented musicians, you know, or in, in all of your cases, talented architects. And you realize once you leave that you're, you're kind of alone, you know what I mean, in, in a sense. Um, and it was just so vibrant being there, like having so many good ideas everywhere you turn and, and you know, being inspired by artists who are trying to really improve every day. And um, that that was just really, it really built me up being around that type of energy and those types of people. And um, even meeting actors now that are famous, like on TV and in movies, and I'll be like, oh, I used to eat with him or her at the cafeteria. That's so weird. <laughs> and just, you know, getting to know these people from their beginning stages and then watching them, uh, you know, achieve their dreams and, and myself included. Um, but I think the hardest thing was the, um, at the, at times this solitary nature of what I did. Um, if you're like a violinist or a cellist or a flute player or a percussionist, you get to play in an orchestra and you probably have two to three hours of orchestra rehearsal five times a week. But the pianists, um, especially in the solo piano track, which is what I was a part of, um, hence the name, we, we are really working to be solo artists that tour and give recitals by ourselves. So at times, I think that was lonely. And I think my other pianist friends, they, they agreed. Um, because you, you really have to prepare so intensely for you know, competitions and recitals and all of the things that are necessary. But it's really only you that can do it. Collaboration is great, but no one can really help you actually practice your repertoire. So, you know, I think in many ways, uh, Juilliard could um, help facilitate, you know, more kind of enjoyable time to spend with your friends or, or meet other people during the school year uh, because everyone just sticks in their practice room and just goes and goes and goes. So that, that was tough. But again, like I said, looking back, had I not practiced that much and for those intense hours, um, I don't know that I would have been able to, you know, graduate with high marks or, you know, perform later in life on a quick deadline. And, you know, all the work we put in early in life um, actually pays exponential dividends later. So while it was really tough in the moment, um, it does have some unforeseen benefits later on. Uh, the favorite part, I kind of touched on it, but uh, it's just being in studio around uh, these amazing students, like sharing our ideas. I felt like it's so rewarding just giving feedback to other people and seeing uh, kind of my feedback uh, being implemented or considered in other people's projects. And the same goes applies for me, like when a student would give me an idea and I would be convinced in the idea to help me, that also felt uh, so nice because 
uh, it's just uh, yeah that collaboration between students really was really beneficial and it made a big part of uh, of my experience in university another thing which i really liked about the course in specific in math is that they provide us with that opportunity to go into practice uh, in my second year and my third year to uh, work with, uh, with in architectural practices which really enriches my experience in university uh, so for anyone who is kind of thinking of applying to the UK, usually it's like an optional thing in universities to go into like placements. Uh, but if it is an option, definitely go for it because it really helps you out and it helps you stand out after you graduate actually to to go into uh, the practices you want to go into because you already have that experience while you're being in practice, while you're being in university. And uh, while you're in university, you're also sponsored by the practice to uh, to go and study so for like visa problems that wouldn't be a problem at all because you would be sponsored by the university to go and practice it so i would really suggest doing a placement for the least favorite part personally i i don't think i can point uh, one thing in specific uh, but the general consensus cons cons consensus in architecture is that uh, architecture could be uh, uh, could be quite demanding which could sometimes lead to kind of uh, ne negative habits and uh, yeah, just uh, unhealthy working habits. Uh, but I think it's like really important. And I think I managed it well, but uh, other some, some other students don't because uh, they sometimes tend to like overwork and uh, it just leads to kind of unhealthy and being unproductive and uh, doing a lot of late nights. So I think the key is to always kind of manage your time well. And uh, yeah, just, just managing your time well and uh, just taking control of your design process and having a healthy work-life balance because you definitely need to do other stuff unless uh, and then you'll, you'll just burn out if you just continuously work and do all these all overnights uh, working in studio that's not healthy uh, so I think like over my time in university maybe at the beginning I was a little bit like overworking but uh, through my these four years I I kind of started to learn to manage my time better and to have more of like healthy habits. Um, honestly, beside the studio, I think uh, my favorite part was um, just as Matthew said, like meeting people who kind of, you know, have the same passions as you. Um, you guys would be passionate about the same things and you would like to do the same things and you'd have like amazing tutors who you look up to and you learn from and um, they become like mentors, um, which brings me back to what Ma Matthew said before, you know, you'd have that one, for example, mentor that you look up to. Um, in our case, honestly, I feel like every single um, tutor had like um, their own like characteristics that, you know, I admired um, in a sense. Um, and I think the most, um, I feel like my favorite part was probably seeing my projects come to life because you work for let's say three months on a project and uh, once you see it actually come together once you press that submit um, button it's like it's done you know so you end up looking back at it and you forget about all the sleepless nights all the you know the hectic days where you didn't know what to do or like you have a design block you know um, so you look at it and you kind of appreciate the journey that you've been through and you appreciate um, where your project is at. You kind of also, like next time you go to the site, you can literally envision the building on the site. Um, and it's crazy to think about, but that's just how it was like. Um, as for my least favorite part, honestly, it's the overworking aspect of it. Um, I think you kind of get very indulged um, into academics, you kind of forget that you have a life other than that. Um, and it kind of gets, you know, tiring at times because um, you're so focused on university and getting the best grades and um, completing your projects and stuff um, that you lose sight of the other important things. Um, and I feel like that was like, um, in a way, the hardest thing for me in first year but as you honestly like continue with your university journey you kind of learn to manage your time 10 times better um, you learn to specify some time um, for the things that you love you have to let's say 
go exercising, cooking for yourself, you know, um, taking care of your mental health. Um, I feel like all of these things, um, in a way, although it seems like you're taking time away from your studies, you're actually giving back like good energy that will help in your designing process, in your way of thinking. Um, and it kind of cuts all of these negative habits. Um, so in a way, it's a, it's a balance. One day you would have, um, you know, you'd be like on a schedule and you would um, have everything figured out. The next day you would kind of be slacking in a way when it comes to like the bad habits. Um, but it's just a mental game, you know, you have to stick to it. And time management is literally the key when it comes to a course like this. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably true for, for a lot of degrees, really. And it's actually interesting. We've had a student question asking what your what's, what would be your best time management hack? If you had any advice, what would be your best time management hack? I think my key to time management success when it worked was simply if you have a large task, right, some huge project you're working on, whether it's designing a gigantic building or for me learning a really long piece, I would, instead of getting overwhelmed, I would take that large project and break it up into very many smaller projects, right? I would learn instead of, if a piece was a thousand measures long, I try to learn eight every day or four every day. And that way you just gradually improve and build upon your um, daily work instead of stressing about how large something is or how daunting a task is or an essay or whatever it might be. And that actually kind of helps you put a stop on your work and then perhaps move to something else. And that way your brain doesn't get stale. So you're actually more productive later when you do the next small chunk. So taking breaks is important, like you just said, and then small manageable tasks that lead to big outcomes. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, for me, I totally agree, like just breaking down the tasks into like smaller bits and uh, also uh, cross checking these with uh, deadlines, like deadlines for my myself, like making sure I have a deadline for this week. Okay, what do I want to achieve in this week? Like I know the in architecture specifically, the design process could be chaotic. It could move like in so many different directions that it's so hard to track. But if you kind of take control of that and make sure you achieve what you want to achieve this week, then you can really achieve the the task you have in hand without uh, overworking on, on so on and having uh, healthy working habits uh, and one thing in architecture in specific is that like in other courses you could you could get the task uh, or you could get like the submission and just leave it until the last uh, two three weeks whatever to work on it and then submit it you could put it off uh, in architecture i think from the first day you need to kind of work as hard as you would on the last day uh, especially since we have these kind of weekly tutorial meetings so if you kind of slack off in the beginning then when you get to that tutorial, you're not going to have enough of enough work to kind of present to your tutor. So you're not going to get much back in return. So starting off early, like early on, uh, putting the effort you need to early on uh, so that that kind of doesn't have a trickle down effect uh, for the submission. Yeah, I 100 percent agree. I think um, soft deadlines and checklists are basically going to be your best friend throughout the whole journey. Um, you have to be disciplined in a, you know, in a good way. Um, leave the big deadline aside, like have it obviously there, but have a softer deadline for yourself to kind of get that done ahead of time in case anything happens, especially with design modules. Um, once you go into like a tutorial, you never know what to expect. They could hate it, they could love it. Um, or you could, you know, completely change the whole idea. Like, on your own. Um, and so I think you have to take precautions when it comes to um, deadlines. Don't leave things to like the last minute. Uh, you have to work every single day, um, but you also have to balance it with like your overall life and you know your social life and um, all of these kinds of you know elements in a sense. Um, and yeah, I think 
um, in a way, don't miss the tutorials, the one-to-one -one tutorials with your tutors. Um, I feel like that's, I, I, it's like a pattern that I notice. If you miss one, then you're technically a week behind from everybody else. Um, so I made it like a, I made like a vow to myself. I wouldn't miss, you know, tutorials. And I feel like honestly, that really helped. And um, I always go into the tutorial open-minded. Um, I feel like whatever they say, even if it is negative, um, it's not something that they're criticizing because they don't like me or, you know, it's literally just a learning curve. You have to learn to take criticism in the right way. Um, and once you do that, you don't let it hold you back. Um, you push forward and you manage your time well. And that's basically how you achieve time management. You get your work done and you continue to prosper. Thank you. That's super interesting for me as well. I always love to hear a, a time management hack. Um, we have time for one super, super quick question. So um, if you could keep your answers short and sweet, but we'd be interested to know if you could go back in time, what is one piece of advice that you would give to your high school self now that you know kind of what you've been through and what you've experienced? You know, the three of us are lucky because we are doing something that we really love and that we enjoy doing. Um, Sadly, though, that's not the case for every person. I mean, like, it's either you don't have the skills necessary, or perhaps like you don't you didn't have the money to attend uni, or whatever it might have been. Everyone has their own challenge, right? And I, I consider myself very blessed that I can have a career based on my passions. Uh, however, it's just important to keep in mind, especially if you are a younger person who may or may not fully understand what you want to do in life, which is totally fine. It's totally normal. Um, I would say broaden your horizons and broaden your scope of education. Looking back, I actually do regret that I was so focused on piano that I didn't take advantage of some of the classes I could have taken at Columbia. And I, I would have loved to maybe have taken a business fundamental course. And that would have even helped me now going back to school for business. But I was so focused on one thing only, and I feel like it, you know, can be a little narrow-minded. So even if you feel like it might take away from you the major that you're dreaming of, consider uh, expanding your educational horizons because you never know, you might want to pursue that later on in life. For me, I think uh, one thing which I would... Uh give my younger self uh, some of the advice is in, in, in architecture and maybe other fine arts degrees, uh, each university has this kind of school of thought, uh, the specific school of thought they're trying to uh, teach the, the students. And at times and in some projects, I think I was kind of too focused on achieving that kind of uh, ideology, that kind of school of thought and pleasing my tutors who, because in architecture it's very subjective, right? Like you you ha can have many different uh, ways of thinking and many different ways of approaching projects. Uh, but to me, I, at some points I was uh, approaching uh, my projects in a way to kind of please the, tu the tutors and to get the, the marks which, were, they had the marks which, which I want and I aspire for. Uh, and I stopped kind of thinking about what I want to do and the way I want to design my own projects. And that's something I kind of learned uh, throughout my time in university to, yeah, to just kind of at times please myself rather than uh, please the tutors and design the way I want to design, not the way the tutors want me to design. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the kind of main point. I think for me personally, the one thing I would tell my high school self is it's all gonna work out. Um, you kind of stress a little bit too much um, and you get a bit anxious when it comes to like a life decision um, that you kind of have to stick to in a way. Um, but I feel like um, you have to kind of enjoy being that young and being in school with all your friends. Because looking back at it, I honestly miss school, you know? Um, and although my university experience was great, um, I do miss that part of me that was kind of like, you know, passionate about 
everything in general, you know. Uh, I always wanted to like, um, you know, participate in different things in school. And I'm honestly very grateful for it because I feel like it um, broadened my, um, you know, I don't know, like my knowledge, let's say, and my skills. Um, and so I feel like maybe less stressing about my university choices and my career would have been nice because I would get to enjoy these things that I used to do a little bit more. Um, but honestly, one thing I would say to do is honestly like delve into everything with like an open mind. Uh, make sure you join activities that you have in school. Um, I, for example, I used to do Modern United Nations. Um, I used to be part of the Community Activity Service Committee, the Students Committee. And by doing that, I kind of got skills that I eventually actually implemented um, into my university life. And um, it taught me, to be honest, time management. So speaking of time management in the previous question, I feel like that's one thing you could do uh, where you could juggle academics and extracurricular activities and um, your passions, and, like your hobbies and like all of these kinds of stuff. Um, and it would actually help you, you know, become a better version of yourself and yeah thank you I think that resonates with anyone who's been at university to be it's very very similar experience I think um so unfortunately we're at the end of our time today I feel like that went really quickly and um, but thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today we've had a really nice time it was such a good insight into your degrees and your experiences and kind of the highlights for you as well as you know other things you had to to learn along the way so thank you for being so open and honest with us um, and thank you to the, to the viewers also for joining us today i'm sure you had a, a really good time joining us today and i hope you've gained some crucial information to guide your decision making process too uh, so once again if you need any help with university or career guidance do check out our website and our instagram page um, and we've put the contact details of our panelists in the chat function today so feel free to go and check those out if you have any questions you think of after the panel they're more than happy for you to get in touch with them um, but thank you once again for joining us. Thank you so much to the panelists, and I hope you all have a really good rest of your day. Likewise. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Millie. Thank, thank you. you so much. It was lovely speaking to you guys. Likewise.